Hey fam, welcome to the Free Trail Podcast and our new presenting sponsor. We're so happy to now be working with The Feed. Thefeed.com forward slash free trail is where you need to go. It is the one-stop shop for all your training and racing nutrition needs. They have over 200 of the world's best nutrition brands stocked in one website. It's a fantastic resource. We've been big customers for a long time. We're really proud to work with them. Some of my favorite products that you can find at thefeed.com forward slash free trail. Gnarly Nutrition Whey Protein Powder. I like the chocolate flavor. I have some of this after every one of my workouts and long runs. For in-run nutrition, Orange Drank. You'll see my big dumb face on it. Also from Gnarly Nutrition, enhanced sodium concentration here in the world's best fueling drink mix. Finally, HVMN Ketone IQ. I have two of these ketone shots basically every single day, once before I go running and once in the middle of the afternoon when I need a little extra energy. Go to thefeed.com forward slash free trail and you're going to get an $80 credit, free money to spend at thefeed.com. It'll be $20 right away and then $20 every 90 days thereafter. You'll also get a sweet trail running will save the world water bottle. Again, that's thefeed.com forward slash free trail. You'll get $80 credit to spend on your favorite nutrition products. And if you are international, they do ship internationally as well. So you can take care or at least take advantage of that great offering from The Feed. Big thanks to The Feed for supporting and thank you for watching the podcast. Amazing. Amazing. Well, Molly Seidel, welcome to the Free Trail Podcast. It's great to meet you and thanks for carving out the time to do this. Oh, I'm so excited to be on. This is fun. You are, of course, a world famous track and road racer who might now be experiencing a full on trail conversion. Who oh knows? We'll find out. This, this <laughs> is what is so hilarious to me that like I well, I was actually talking with um, other famous trail runner, Grayson Murphy, the other day, and I was joking. I'm like, how the hell did everybody find out about this so quickly? And why is it such a big deal? She's like, Molly, the minute you won that medal, nothing can be low key anymore. Like you can't just go and do stuff for fun anymore. People freak out anytime you do something. Well, I'd love to hear any advice that Grace and Murphy bestowed upon you in advance of your first ultra marathon, but we'll get to that here <laughs> a little later on in our conversation. We have to start in the traditional place here, Molly. I ask everybody the same opening question. That is, what makes you, you? What are your unique strengths and weaknesses? How do they show up in your life? Mm, I think what makes me, me is that I, I feel like I am pretty like I keep it pretty real pretty honest and I like to bring a level of authenticity to to my racing to my training to kind of what I do and how I interact and so that's kind of just part of all of this anyway like me going and doing a trail race that's like just kind of just how I am I'm not necessarily the kind of person that is going to just uh keep doing one thing my entire life I like to explore a little bit try new things have fun with it um yeah, I was a little bit all over with that question, but hopefully <laughs> that's me. <laughs> no, that that's exactly you and I are just meeting for the first time. But mm -hmm. if I had to answer that question, I would probably say the same thing. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the reasons why so many people have resonated with mm -hmm. you and with your story. And I'm sure we'll come around and talk about a bunch of that stuff here later in the conversation. I went back and watched the video of your parents uh, who are tuning into your bronze medal performance at the mm -hmm. Tokyo Olympics. And your mom said on the local news, <laughs> never underestimate the power of Molly. She is one <laughs> tough cookie. Yeah. And maybe this is a question that would be better posed to your mother. But where does the power of Molly come from? Or what is your mother referencing in that quote? Ooh, I think... I think my mom has understood from a really young age that when I am really passionate about something and when I set my mind to it, it is like physically impossible to stop me. Like she, I, nobody in my family ran growing up. Like she started out by like me coming to her and being like, mom, there's like a track team that our church is putting on because our team or our school didn't have a team. And I was like, I really want to do this. And she did not understand like the level of commitment that I had. Like she drove me to my first race. I was so nervous. I threw up in a trash can and like couldn't race. And so she was like, that's probably en the end of that. And like the next week I was like, no, we're going to the next track race. And she was like, okay, whatever. And like from there it just kind of took off. So I think it's like, she knows that when I get like that fire under my butt that I'm like pretty unstoppable. <laughs> Tell me a little bit more about that because in that same it was like a 
local news article that I read with an embedded video of your parents. And it was saying something about your high school, which I think you're just mentioning here. It was like a K through 12 school, mm-hmm. but there was only a thousand people. No, there in was, the, no, less than that. My graduating class had 13 kids in it. Like we had 70 kids in the high school. Unbelievable. So yeah. <laughs> tell, tell me about that because like, obviously now you live a very public life. And one of the things you mentioned in the, what makes you, you answer is that you keep it super real and you're very open and honest about really everything that evolves in both your personal and professional life. And again, I think that's one of the reasons why a lot of people respect and appreciate you growing up in a tiny environment is kind of the complete opposite Mm -hmm. of living a, you know, professional athletic public life. Yeah. Does it feel like that? A little bit. And I think even just the factor of it being the Midwest, like I always joke that like the Midwest has a certain, like everything is veiled. You never get to say what you're actually thinking. Like you always have to kind of keep it under wraps. And I was a really, really shy kid. Like I, I think that's why probably like people that I grew up with are a little bit surprised with like the person that I've grown into just because like I was the kid that like I didn't have a ton of friends. Like I was very, very quiet. I read a lot more books than I did like go to parties or whatnot. And running always was that kind of way for me to really feel like myself and express myself. And it was for me that way to actually like, I don't know, to grow a little bit and to branch out and to find my true self. And I think I discovered through that running that like I had a pretty powerful voice and like that I don't know people were willing to like people were willing to listen to the things that I had to say which is something that like I never experienced as a kid or like that I always had to fit into this very specific box so running has been such an empowering thing for me because I feel like it has given me this voice that I never got to have as a kid so Building on this, being a decorated athlete from such a young age, I mean, you won the Foot Locker mm-hmm. cross country race, which is sort of the biggest race for high school age kids. Mm-hmm. Obviously, you're a professional athlete now, but you always have sort of marched to the beat of your own drum. And I've actually <laughs> spoken to uh, other people in your in more in your circle in the road and track racing scene who Mm -hmm. characterize you in that way (laughs) endearingly you know like everybody (laughs) seems to have a really positive impression of you but it made me want to like wonder the super cliche of like what did you want to be when you grew up like if Mm -hmm. if if you were pulled into running based on your talent or if it was something that you've always wanted to do because I could see Mm -hmm. it in both ways, just based on how it feels like you've conducted your career, you do march to the beat of your own drum. And part of that maybe is reflected in trail running, but sometimes maybe, I don't know, to me, it feels like you get exhausted by, you know, the realities of being a a professional athlete. I think it's, I get exhausted by like the conventions of what pro running is. And like, Frank, I was just talking to my sister about this, that I get so fucking bored with just how cliche the pro side of our sport can be like it's funny I think it is this chicken and the egg thing of like I wonder that sometimes I'm like do I like running just because I was really good at it but no I think my love of it did come like running for me always was something that I was really passionate about that I really love and getting to do it in my own way I think is what has what like it's what's led to my success in it and the times when I feel myself having to try to be something that I'm not to fit into something different. Those are the times that I've struggled a little bit. Um, I think of like an example of like when I was in high school, like we had like our track team was pretty much like me and my sister and like maybe a handful of other kids of like by my senior year. But like for the majority of it, it was kind of just me doing my own thing. And like, I was able to express myself in a way that was pretty uncommon. Like at the time, like I didn't have a team that I needed to fit into and I could just do what I needed to do um, with the support of my coach. And then I got to college and I convinced myself, I'm like, I have to do things a certain way. I have to fit into this box. I need to be a quote unquote real runner. And I absolutely sucked (laughs) for my first two years of college. It was horrible. Um, I was like, we had a lot of other factors going on, but it was trying to fit into this conventional box of what I needed to be to be a quote unquote, like good runner. I think I really struggled. And 
when our my first college coach left and a new coach came in, Matt Sparks, and he just saw that immediately. He was like, this girl needs to just like be able to like express herself and do her thing. And it was like perfect. And by the end of that year, I had won an NCAA championship. So I think it's that, that it's just like when I can like kind of almost like trained by like what my heart tells me to do, it leads to a lot of success. Go deeper on that. I'm really curious. So in what ways did that coach help you tune in to that personality or, or freedom that unlocked the next level of performance? I think part of it was just the training side too. Like I have a pretty good intuitive sense of like what my body needs for training. And so those first few years of college, I was really trying to fit into like a uh, my, the coach then was very much like, you're going to be a 1500 5k runner. You need to do XXX. You need to train VO2 max all the time, low mileage, but super high intensity. I was like, I don't think this is what I should be doing. Um, and I got, su- I was super banged up, super hurt and just like physically exhausted. And I was going to quit the team after my sophomore year. Cause I was just like, this is just not working. I'm not enjoying this. And I was actually studying anthropology. And so I went down to Argentina because I was working on a dig down there. And when I was down there, there was an ultra runner on the dig and I would just train with her a bunch. I was dealing with a lot of like culture shock. So I started running like a hundred miles a week up in the Andes. I would wake up like before the sun rose, run, work in the mountains all day and then run after we finished work. And I came back and I was super fit. And this new coach came in and I kind of went into his office and I was just like, yo, like, I, I know how this goes when I try to just like acquiesce to somebody and like, I'm not going to just like bend down and take it. And he was like, no, like, I want you to be able to do what you want to do. I'm going to let you run a hundred miles a week. I'm going to let you train how you want to train. And he obviously gave me guidance and he didn't just like, let me do my own thing. But like, he really gave me a lot of freedom to train the way I wanted to train. And it was like, that was just like it. Mm-hmm. Perfect. Mm-hmm. Look at you. <laughs> experiencing the altitude of the Argentinian Andes. It all makes perfect sense. That, now you're going to be a trail runner. This is just a, what a perfect story. Those are my all first trail together. races too. That's <laughs> my, the, the woman, Vale, she was like, do you want to come to some of these races? I was like, yeah, sure. I had no idea what I was getting myself into. And they were like 20 mile trail races. And like trail is like a strong word. They were just like off-roading. I would come back just like, <laughs> like bruises and scratches and everywhere. But it was really fun. And it helped me like just like rediscover that love of what what the sport of running is it was community there were tons of people at it like it was an energy that I felt that I hadn't felt in a really long time you're one of us Molly I can already tell (laughs) you mentioned your you mentioned your sister Izzy a couple of times here and it feels to me like you two are really close and almost operate as creative partners Mm. in some ways tell me a little bit about the sibling connection and bond you two share yeah so it's uh, I'm like all of a, all three of us technically. So I have a brother as well, Fritz and growing up, we were all very, very close. Like we, we were almost raised like triplets. And so I am very, very close to my sister. We live together in Boston. Um, yeah, you kind of said it right that we almost are like creative partners now. And I think she's a really good, like yin to my yang of stuff. Like Izzy is the queen of self-promotion. She is so smart when it comes to, just like the social media landscape. And she worked in brand strategy for a long time. She's worked for Tracksmith. She worked for 10,000 for Peloton. And so she understands that side of the world really, really well. And is like, she just has such a sense of like the pulse of like, kind of like running culture that I appreciate. So it's fun. Like, we'll just talk about like big ideas that we've got for the sport or just like, what the hell we're doing with our lives and this whole sad girl track club thing kind of arose from that of uh, <laughs> both of us like feeling like running can just be so boring and stuck up and elitist sometimes that it needs a little dose of levity to to make it like just to make it more relatable. Tell me more about the Sad Girl Track Club, because it's something that I've heard about peripherally, but I don't know any details. So what was the <laughs> idea behind it and what does it mean practically? Sad Girl Track Club is something that I always feel like such an idiot trying to explain to people. Um, but it basically arose out of me and Isabel sending back and forth raccoon demotivational memes on Instagram, <laughs> which is like 
if your algorithm tunes a certain way, you get a lot of them. There's a weird niche of the internet. That there's a lot of these. So we would send them back and forth all the time, specifically during the pandemic. And we just thought it would be funny to start making our own memes um, in regards to running, like raccoon demotivational running memes. So now another section, like even more <laughs> specific onto that. And we found that people started really like resonating with it. And so Izzy just in her brand strategy mind just started making these hats that became really, really popular. And we started doing like group runs at events and just finding ways to like bring the community together because finding that like there was almost this like desire. It's like kind of the, um, I'm trying to think of what the attitude is. It's almost like the anti, like, it's like this anti elitist, anti hardcore mentality of just like the idea of like, if you really don't feel like, like if you're feeling injured or not like wanting to go out and do a long run, fucking don't do a long run. You can go and walk, do anything else. Or like after the Chicago marathon, we're like, let's do a post-race walk. Like who wants to do a pre-race shake? Oh, that. <laughs> yeah. That's like, we always do after parties with free trail. It's like yeah. everybody does shake out rounds. We do after parties. Yeah. It's like, that's okay. just objectively the better way to do it. Like, I mean, yeah, like yeah. you can be happy that the race is over. Like, and so it's a little bit of that, of just, Honestly, the biggest thing is like, I feel like community is the thing that a lot of people are searching for within running and not community that's tied to a specific brand, not community that's tried, tied to a specific marker of performance. Just being able to go out and share, like share friendship and stories with other people. I feel like that's at the core of it. Yeah. See, wait till you come to Canyons, Molly. You're going to be indoctrinated very quickly. I cannot, we'll get to that in a little bit. I can't wait to drink the fucking Kool-Aid. I'm so excited. Oh, man. I'm going to be surfing it up in big, huge water bottles full for you. <laughs> um, so coming back to where we started with like keeping it real, right? Obviously, everybody has talked about your bronze medal performance. I'm sure you've been interviewed about it a billion times. What I'd love to hear you talk about is that like post elation come down. Obviously mm -hmm. there's that phenomenon where with Olympic athletes, when you're on that four year cycle mm -hmm. and you go to the games, you accomplish this dream, especially in your case, mm -hmm. bringing home a medal, even though that's a peak life achievement mm -hmm. and an experience that you'll never forget. There's a, a, a hard come down. Talk about that a little bit. What did it feel like after that life-defining achievement? And what was the reality of returning back to normal life? Honestly, the reality is one of the deepest depressions I've ever been in. Because it's like, and yeah, not to like bring the mood down, but it is this weird thing of like, especially when you're on this conventional track of high school track athlete, college track athlete, professional runner, move up through the ranks, get to the Olympics, win a medal, you do all the things that like society or the sport tells you, if you do these things, these are objective markers of success. These will lead to happiness. And standing up on that podium, yeah, that was truly a peak life experience that like will forever be one of the happiest I've ever been. And then it's this weird thing that you fly home and you get back into your house and you sit down and you're like, shit, I'm still the same exact person. I'm not fixed. This didn't fix anything. And it was a really, really hard realization to be like, now what? Because, and I think sometimes it takes getting to that pinnacle to realize that the conventional markers of success are not these like keys to opening the doors of happiness. And I think that's where like maybe athletes that don't make it to the Olympics or don't win a medal, they'll always think that, that like, man, maybe if I had just made it to that next level, then I'll be truly happy. Then I'll be truly like vindicated in all of this. And it's, it's a really hard thing to realize that of just like, oh, I really have to do the work to figure out who I am, what I want, what what things I do in my life to be the person that I ultimately want to be. Because to get that medal, I had to strip away a lot of parts of myself that like, I'm trying to think of the right way to say this. It's such a, you have to become so narrowly focused to get that. I had to become such a very specific kind of athlete. And 
And, and like, it was worth it for me to be able to go and like really go after that goal. But I came home from it and realized, man, like I feel like a shell of myself. And I think it's taken the better part of the last three years to kind of start figuring out who I am again. And ultimately I think it took get, having a major injury and not getting to compete in this summer's Olympics as well, that it felt like this almost like weirdly full circle moment of cross-training myself into the ground, feeling myself stripping all these things away again, and then hitting this point the day before I dropped out of the marathon of realizing I'm like, I know where this train goes. Even if I make the Olympics again, even if I do everything again, do it right, win another medal, I know where this train goes of me stripping all these things away, that it comes home from me and it comes home and I'm miserable again. And I don't want to keep doing that. Was there a sense of relief almost then when you pulled the plug and decided to be a did not start at this year's Olympic trials? Because obviously I saw your post about it and you deal with it admirably. You didn't force yourself to go to the start line just to have a massively disappointing mm -hmm. underperformance or exacerbate your injury. Mm -hmm. But when you're recognizing that you're making these sacrifices that are stripping away pieces of you that are valuable in service of mm -hmm. a goal that you've already achieved and that you've recognized is not the key to happiness. Was there a subtle relief in that realization? I don't know if relief is the right term, but I think it felt like over the last three years, I have done a lot. Like since that moment of like, really kind of like hitting rock bottom, um, like a, a couple months after the Olympics, I've really done a lot of work to kind of build myself back up. I feel like a very different person now. And I feel like a person that is able to respect themselves a lot more and be a lot more balanced and dropping out of the Olympic trials, I think felt, it felt very true to myself. Like it felt like I was honoring that person that I've become and it felt like a real moment of like realizing how much I've grown that in the past, I wouldn't have had the strength to do that. I would have lined mm. up and fucking torn my knee to shreds trying to do this. And it felt like I was able to be in this place where I could honor my body's knees, me, needs, my body's knees. Yeah. <laughs> I could honor my knees, um, but I could honor it like the needs and the limits of my own body. And also honor what I like when I line up to race, I want to be lining up and knowing that I am ready to go at it and ready to qualify for that team. And in the state mm -hmm. that I was in, I wasn't. And so I'm not going to dishonor what I believe the Olympic trials marathon is about. And it was hard. It's like, it will probably still be one of the hardest decisions I've ever made. And like, and frankly, I've been like in the, like, I've just been really sad since then. Like the last few months since then I've been like, giving myself the space to just grieve this dream, like this goal of mine that I've had for four years. I've been working on this thing for four years and it just fell apart in my hands and I'm fucking bummed and I need to let myself grieve it so that I can come back around for 2028 and still have the energy and excitement to do it. Cause if I don't, I think if you don't process emotions in the right way, it comes out in weird ways. Yeah. That's sport, isn't it? Yeah. And you have to honor your needs and your needs. And your physical <laughs> needs. <laughs> the point of pure personal curiosity here, does Team USA offer resources for this? Because obviously mm -hmm. this is a well-known phenomenon in Olympic sport where there is this come down after the cycle. Is there any support provided mm -hmm. by the U.S. Olympic Committee? Yeah, honestly, Team USA has been incredible beyond what I could have thought. Like all of my mental health, treatment is through team USA. Like my therapist is through team USA. They have been super helpful with giving me access to resources, like in order to get my head screwed on straight again, even like when my knee blew up, like I went out to Colorado and got a procedure done on my knee, like two weeks before trials. They are like end to end. So good. With, like I've kind of been shocked with that. And like just being able to feel like I am like looked after has been really, really nice. What has your relationship been to fame kind of coming back to the, this small town, small horrible. school? It's horrible. Really, it's, right, say a few words about it because you could see it being both a blessing and a curse. So maybe you could provide an example mm -hmm. of ways in which it's been positive for you and ways in which it's been mm -hmm. oppressive or overwhelming. Yeah, I think I 
I almost look back on the person that I was four years ago and I have a lot of sympathy for, for that, <laughs> that girl, just because I think I wasn't prepared for what even like, and obviously this is such a niche kind of fame. Like I'm not going to pretend like I'm Rihanna, but like it is, it is weird to go from like being a relative unknown in the professional world. Like obviously i had had success in high school, in college, but like making it in the professional world is just a different level. And I think my story blew up so much after the Olympics specifically that it was that it was like this weird switch had been flipped and all of a sudden I went from being able to feel like I was just a normal person living their life to anytime I go to a running event, there are eyes on me that I can't, I don't have the luxury kind of like Grayson said of getting to like slip under the radar for things anymore that anything I do is going to be analyzed and cut apart. And, and I think it was some of those moments of like, weird things that I joke about of just like getting spotted in public all the time and people talking about it or like people analyzing my training on Strava and things like that. It's, it can feel a little suffocating sometimes, but then at the same time, there is so much power to it. And I'm never going to like, obviously I complain about it a lot, but it's like, it is this luxury that I have that like, I have such a platform for the things that I'm doing, the things that I care about that it's like, it is this huge blessing. Like I get to be taken seriously in the things that I do. And so it's like, it is this two edged sword. Yeah, I can see it being that way. And it did come on so quickly, (laughs) as you said, like immediately after the Olympics that I imagine there wasn't a lot of time to adjust to the new reality, but you have been so open Mm -hmm. to use your words. You keep it very real and you're (laughs) incredibly authentic. And I bet there's satisfying exchanges or messages that you receive from people who, who are inspired by your story or who are grateful that you are open and authentic. I think that's been the coolest part of all of this. And like, and ultimately what, like, I hope that like my legacy as an athlete, like I could give or take people respecting me for the times that I run for the things that I accomplish. I hope that I can give People who are like me, people who like maybe deal with mental health issues, who like maybe deal with not feeling confident in what they do, that they can have hope that like you can still be successful despite all of that. Like I was the kid with undiagnosed ADHD that couldn't talk to people. And it's like and I've been able to use this sport of running to become a person that I'm really proud of and like the person that I always hoped that I could become. And so it's like. I really hope that there's kids out there who have ADHD or might have like eating disorder, stuff like that, that know, like it will get better. It can get better. And you don't have to be this perfect being in order to be successful in whatever you define as successful. Awesome. Talking briefly about your marathon career, Mm -hmm. because obviously it's been relatively short, but Mm. incredibly successful, but there have been ups and downs. Meditate on sort of the reverse learning curve because famously you made the Olympic team in your first marathon Mm. you were sixth, I think at, was it London Mm. at around 225 and then you won a bronze medal. Mm. And then obviously you had some adversity at the DNF at Boston, the not starting at the trials Mm -hmm. and at the world championships last year. Of course you did PR at Chicago last fall, but Mm -hmm. it seems to me like there is this sort of reverse learning curve where the success was sort of concentrated in the first couple of years. And then the last couple have been difficult. Like (laughs) what, what what do you think? What do you think uh, that, like, what do you attribute to that? Like the, the hot Mm -hmm. start, the, uh, the beginner's luck maybe is the wrong word, but Mm -hmm. you were successful right out of the gates Mm -hmm. And that's not something that a lot of people are are able to, to brag about. So what do you attribute the reverse learning curve to? Yeah, I think some of it is a little bit of that of like there, I think there's a certain power to being able to go into an event and having no expectations surrounding it, like around trials, that was objectively one of the hardest courses that probably they'll ever have for a trials race. Like it was 
just, it was a nightmarish course. And I think a lot of veteran athletes really struggled on it, but because I had nothing to compare it to, I was able to be like, yeah, this is just how you're supposed to feel in a marathon where everybody else is like, no, this is like objectively terrible. And so, and I think the same goes for the Olympics. Like I thrive in really, really tough conditions. And I think that's shown a little bit that like, I am not quite as successful when all the conditions are perfect, when it's flat, when it's fast, but like when the going gets tough, that's where I really kind of thrive. And so I think I had a certain amount of luck that a lot of these early marathons for me really played into that. The Olympics was the same thing. You're not supposed to run a marathon when it's 95 degrees. And it's like, and a lot of veterans suffered in it. And I'm not going to like, I mean, the woman in front of me was the world record holder in no other circumstance would I be within 30 seconds of a world record holder. But it's like, I made the most of the conditions. And I think that's where I thrive as an athlete. I'm not the fastest. I might not be the strongest, but I am a very versatile athlete. And then I think my own, my own shit and my own baggage came back to bite me. Like I, I have a very all or nothing mentality and it's almost this burn it down mentality that has garnered me a lot of success, but it's not great for sustainability. Um, And I think it's like, I was able to have all this success and then, yeah, the, like it all catches up to you and everything started breaking down. I wasn't taking care of my mental health. I wasn't taking care of my body. And that is part of what this sport is. And it's a lesson that I had to learn and I learned it the hardest way possible. But like, frankly, I want to keep doing this sport for another 10 years. Hopefully, like I turned 30 this summer. Um, I want to keep doing this till I'm 40. And I needed to learn this lesson that it's like, if you don't take care of your shit, your shit will come back to get you. And it's like, yeah, I know that now I learned it the hard way. I don't get to compete in this year's Olympics. And now I have four years to prepare myself for LA. And it's like, and I know all these things and it's like, okay, you can either keep repeating the same shit that you've been doing or learn from it. So cool, Molly. It's funny because I was just having this conversation with somebody else. I'm a decade older than you. I just turned 38. <laughs> mm-hmm. But it reminds me of something I was just talking about with somebody my age, and that is that once you get to like your mid to late 30s, mm-hmm. your shit absolutely catches up with you. Mm-hmm. So it's good to confront it younger because like mm-hmm. when I see a lot of my old friends now, like for the people who have not taken care of themselves or who have not eaten well or who have not been exercising since Mm -hmm. our college days or who maybe are drink have been drinking too much and it's lasted a decade Mm -hmm. you wear that stuff when you're older Mm -hmm. and it's sort of like what you're saying with running too and with being a professional athlete and all the expectations and self-perception that's attached to our performances Mm -hmm. if you don't experience that adversity and therefore confront your own shit eventually Mm -hmm. it's going to come and find you like it does for those of us in our mid to late 30s so yeah and it's like and I think that's just the nature of what it is like I had the luxury of like having success early and I think like it's almost this weird thing of a lot of or like a lot of athletes don't get to have that metal moment or this big moment until very late in their careers and it's kind of a weird thing to have it that it's like, oh yeah, like in the second year of my marathoning, like to win a medal. And it's like, okay, now you have to learn how to live with these expectations, live with this pressure, live with all of this, even if you don't see yourself as the person deserving of that yet. Like I, Mm. it was like, I won this medal and I always expected that like, I've always believed that I was the kind of person that could win an Olympic medal, but I always thought it would come like, at the end of a storied career, like as the pinnacle rather Uh, than like, Oh, you hit it big right away. Now you get to deal with this forever. And it's like, is it going to be a pair of bronze like handcuffs or are you going to use this to redefine yourself and propel yourself to something big? And I think I needed to come to terms with that a little bit. So awesome. So fun to chat with you. Tell me about your coach, Jonathan Green. It feels to me like he's a really interesting and important, important character in Mm -hmm. your career. I read the article about him that Tracksmith Mm -hmm. published. He's a young guy. He had never, he's never run a marathon himself. I don't think he'd really ever coached an elite athlete like yourself, but he feels like a natural. Tell us about Jonathan. What makes him special? John Green is the reason why I am the athlete that I am. Like, so 
the background on that is that John and I were teammates together on the first professional team that we both went on out of college. And we both really struggled on that team. Um, it was a tough environment. It was a very classic, like hardcore <laughs> kind of where I learned that burn it down mentality. But um, the I ended up leaving the team in 2019 and John was one of my closest friends. And while I was trying to figure out what I was going to do for my next step, transitioning from being a 10K runner that like just got injured all the time, um, he was like, I'll just write you workouts. Like, I'm your friend. I care about you. I'm going to write you workouts. We'll figure out the next step. And I started to have a lot of su or success in training. He let me kind of mold, like, let me have a lot of input into what I was doing. And he was obviously so young. He was still running professionally at the time um, that we were kind of just like taking it as it comes, having fun with it. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I went into trials. I made the team and he became the youngest coach ever to coach an Olympic athlete. So he is like a coaching prodigy. Like he's really, really good at it. And then obviously he like trained through the pandemic. He ended up getting dropped as a pro athlete and he went all in on coaching. And I think it really strengthened our bond for what we had. I go to the Olympics and now he has become the youngest athlete or the youngest coach ever to coach an Olympic medalist. And so I like, I get a lot of press for kind of this, like, like very like sharp trajectory I've had, but like, John, I think, does not get enough credit for just how talented he is at, at what he does and just how good of a coach he is, how emotionally intelligent he is. And I think that's his true strength that he brings, that he sees every athlete that he coaches as like a, a real individual, which I know that shouldn't be like a shocking thing. But like <laughs> in the pro world, that is mm. mind blowing. <laughs> One of the things he said in the article referencing you is he said, she's not someone who blindly follows. And I think maybe this goes back to what we were saying about your career at Notre Dame and recognizing that you needed a little bit more freedom or to follow your own instincts a little bit more in your training. Mm -hmm. And this is probably an example of his high EQ. What do you think, Jonathan, what do you think made Jonathan say that about you that you're not somebody who blindly follows. <laughs> I think it's because I challenge him constantly on stuff. Like, <laughs> like why are we doing this today? Exactly. Coach? Come well, on. Cause John knows that I am not the kind of person that I'm like, if he sends me a training schedule, I'm going to be asking, why are we doing this? Why are we doing this here? Why? Like, like, and there's a lot of times where like, I'll suggest something or like want to change something and it'll be a conversation rather than him just like dictating on high, what the schedule is going to be or whatnot or say like, even when I came to it, I was like, hey, like, I want to introduce some trail racing into here in an effort to get stronger. He's like, let's talk about it. Like, and it becomes a conversation and he's super open to new ideas. I think that's what makes him really, really strong that it's like he doesn't. I And I think part of this comes from being a young guy. Like we had to learn the marathon together. Like he had never coached a marathon athlete. I He had never coached an athlete before me. And so it was like it feels like we've grown up together a little bit in this sport and we're constantly learning from each other. We're constantly growing together. And that's why it really feels like it feels like a partnership more than anything. And I like, I don't think I could be as successful under any other person because I don't think like they would be able to understand like how, I function quite as well. And I, and it's like, not every athlete that John coaches is like me. Like he's had yeah. to learn how to deal with athletes that like want to be given daily mileage. Like that was a weird th thing for him to transition into, but huh. it's like, he is always wanting to learn and grow and keep talking about these things. Okay. So you just referenced it. Bring us into the conversation where you introduced the idea of signing up for a trail ultra marathon with John. What was his initial reaction and how'd that conversation evolve? He was actually all for it. Like, and I, I went into it talking about like, so my main goal with this, you're about to go and we're, we're getting to that. Yeah. We're, we're, we're <laughs> getting ahead. inside the mind of Molly, but like, my rationale is so traditional marathon running and, and track running. It's such a sterilized environment for, for running that a lot of athletes will experience over the course. You almost like constrict a little bit. Your muscles tighten up in a certain way. You get so used to moving at a certain pace in a certain direction 
that you lose a lot of athleticism and like dynamicism. I don't think that's a word, but I'm just going to go with it. Dynamism. Dynamism. Di- yeah. Dynamicness. <laughs> yes. There we go. But, um, and I've really felt that. And I think it's led to a lot of injuries over the last few years. And for me, like trail running and just other sports used to make up a huge bulk of my training, especially when I was in high school. And so some of the rationale in this is like, I am not switching to trails full time here. Like I still uh, very, uh, I, I know. Wait I till I feed you the Kool-Aid. Wait I till know, I feed you exactly. the Kool-Aid. Maybe if I'm successful at trails, I will, but there's <laughs> yeah. not enough money in trails yet. Um, yeah. Okay. But basically my goal is like, obviously to try and like do a fall marathon and I'm where my brain is at is like, what will help me get my strength, my dynamism, <laughs> um, <laughs> back for being able to do a fall marathon, specifically some of the harder, hillier ones. Let's do a more dynamic sport, something akin to cross country, but more so, aka trail running, some of these longer, flowier races that will help develop that strength, develop that power, and also just have some fucking fun. Like, I'm sorry, racing on the track is not fun. I was like considering doing the 10K for a bit. I'm like, wait, I hate running the 10K on the track. That's why I don't do it anymore. And so it's like, honestly, it's the, like I pitched to him as like, hey, like I want to do this, be able to get my strength back and become just more athletic, be doing different motions, be doing different things. And also just like get the love of running back here. And he was like, go for it. Like m- take my blessings, like go and do it. And he's coached Grayson in the past as well. So it's like, oh, he knows this wow. world. Yeah. Cool. Mm-hmm. I didn't realize that. Yeah. Okay. So before we get to canyons, I want to hear about speed goat because <laughs> I've been a trail guy for my whole career and I've done the 50 K twice and mm-hmm. suffered immensely both times. You've now done the 28 K <sighs> twice fucking jumping into the, <laughs> it, that fucking race, dude. It's such an ass kicker. Mm-hmm. And that's what I was going to ask. I mean, it's 17 mile race with 6,000 feet of climbing, mm-hmm. pretty ridiculous introduction to the world of trail running. Why did you choose that? that instead of something that's maybe a bit more analogous to the road marathon it was just straight up impulse like (laughs) i my my boyfriend at the time he was up in salt lake i was spending the summer in salt lake i knew that was happening i was like hell why not it's a trail race i've done trail races in the past not realizing that that is a different like that is a straight up like mountain race and i think i didn't in my mind realize the difference between mountain racing and trail racing until i got on the mountain and i did it the first year finish and i was like i am never doing that again that was the worst experience of my life like seeing people because i'm terrible at running downhills seeing girls just tumbling end over end down those like 45 degree slopes i'm like oh my god this is absolute madness And then the next year, I like last year, I had really bad anemia and I couldn't race on the roads. I just wasn't going to be fast enough to race on the roads while I was getting iron infusions. Mm. But I was like, I mean, I'm still pretty fit. I could probably do it. And so just like my dumb ass just hopped in again. And it's like, I don't know. It's kind of fun. It's so different from what I usually do. And I think that's more of it. It's the novelty of it. And so now it's like, hey, if I can do that, I feel like I can do anything. (laughs) Yeah. Okay, so you just made me want to ask, too, about the perception of trail Mm -hmm. among your peers and your cohort in the professional road and track world. To what extent has trail punctured that bubble? Is it a topic of conversation among the pros? No, No, it's not. And I think that's a real problem. Like, as someone who's so, like, I've gone out to Chamonix over the last few years, not to race, just to, like, observe and kind of, like, be in the mix of it. And I think it took doing that to realize just how big trail racing had become. And I know that like all of your listeners are going to be like, fuck off. Like, but for like within the pro road running and track world, which is granted super fucking elitist, there really isn't, nobody's paying attention to trail. And I think I truly believe that trail is kind of like the next frontier within racing and seeing how big it's becoming and just seeing like, but I honestly think it's, it's that like, I think trail running right now is where road running was in like the seventies and eighties where it's like, it's picking up steam and it's really on the cusp of like becoming more, I don't know, just like, I don't know. I hope that trail running always keeps that kind of dirt baggy energy a little bit, but it's like, I think it's really on the cusp of like becoming really, like really, really big, like New York Mm -hmm. city marathon big, like, 
And it, and it's a little bit of that. I feel like there needs to be a little bit more crossover between uh, like athletes who are big on the roads and on the track into trail in order to like, I don't know, make it slightly more mainstream and not to like, I feel like we're just like, keep mentioning Grace in here. It's like Beetlejuice. Yeah. Like we'll say her name three times and she'll appear in the background. But um, yeah. it like, it's someone like her who it's like, I think she's really given a level of just like acceptability to trail and be like, Oh yeah. She's like an elite steeplechaser. And like she's going and winning a lot of stuff on the trail. So I think it's that, that there just needs to be more crossover as it brings itself into the fold. It's interesting because that is just starting to happen for the first time. And I've been deeply immersed in this community for 15 plus years. And Grayson is sort of like one of the original crossover athletes. But now, for example, like Anna Gibson, who just mm -hmm. came out of the University of Washington, is making a go both on the trails and on the track. And mm -hmm. I only I think that'll be only more common as a phenomenon here in future years. Tell me more about your experience at UTMB. I'm really curious <laughs> about this because for us, that is the Boston Marathon yeah. or whatever. I think you were there with Koros. What were your initial reactions to the Super Bowl trail running? Oh my God. It is, it is next level. Like going out there, I didn't realize how big in Europe mountain racing is. And it's like, you get out there and it is like, it is mind blowing. It's almost like... <laughs> It kind of felt like in a, like Wizard of Oz when like all the color gets switched on. You're just like, oh, my God, this is like completely different from what I thought it was. And just seeing the energy and how many like even just normal people are doing this objectively insane trail race. Like obviously you have the elite side of the sport, but I think what's truly inspiring is like there are just normal people with jobs who are going out and like trail racing a hundred miles around Mont Blanc. Like the mountains out there are not like here in the States. They are straight up and down. And so I think it's that, that it took seeing a little bit to realize and be there and be like, oh, this sport is going to take over everything. <laughs> yes. Yes, it is. Kool-Aid. Yeah. <laughs> Kool-Aid coming at you. All right. So canyons. Mm -hmm. You sent a small internet shockwave through the trail running <laughs> internet ecosystem. I think it was Canadian running who reported that you were I on the canyon. I know how they found out about it. <laughs> so do I. So do I. I actually know, I know Keely, who I think was the person who published that article. So I need to send her a note and ask her how she figured it out. Give them but like anyway. a Pulitzer for investigative <laughs> journal. Because they, I, they, like, it was actually like scary to me of like, I had just been talking with John about like, man, like, I feel like. It's like, it's so weird. Like, I feel like people just find out about stuff. Like, I can't do anything under the radar anymore. And he's like, Molly, you are being so dramatic. People do not give that much of a shit about what you do. And then all of a sudden I get sent an article on Canadian running, like right after I got off the wait list for that race. Like, I was like, how the hell do they know? Pulitzer, Pulitzer. I yeah. love it. <laughs> so you sort of talked a little bit about the why so maybe just expanding on that a little bit, like the alternative would have been you DNS at the Olympic trials. Mm. Let's go to Tokyo or London or Boston. Mm. Why canyons? Like, and why the 50 K and like, also like, let's be clear. You're jumping in with some of the top dogs in the mm. U S especially. And it's not like you could have gone to any number of the hundreds of mom and pop local grassroots trail races. Mm -hmm. So why, <laughs> why choose this instead of, you know, a spring road marathon? And to what extent are you approaching it like a professional and competitively? So the answer is going to be really underwhelming for you. So originally like dropping out of trials, my knee was like really, really fucked up. And for a while, the only thing that I could do was uphill ski mowing and like, like climbing mountains. I was over in Europe for a few weeks. And so like, all I could do was just walk up and down mountains. I couldn't even run yet. Um, and so I knew that a spring marathon was going to be out. I just couldn't like, I would have had to be like hard. Like I know what it takes to be competitive at a road marathon nowadays. And I'm like, it's just not going to happen. Like I, I can't run pain free on like straight ground early enough to be able to make that happen. So I'm like, okay, that's out. Maybe a track 10 K. I was, it just wasn't setting my soul on fire. And so 
legitimately on a whim, I reached out to, um, I reached out to UTMB because last year at Speedgoat, they told us that if you got top three at the 28K, that you'd get an entry to OCC. They informed me that they no longer were honoring that. No, don't even get excited about that. They said that they switched the qualifying system, so they're revoking that. They don't honor that anymore. So I'm like, oh, shit, that sucks. Is there a different way to qualify? They're like, well, you could do canyons. My dumb ass, I did not realize how big canyons were. (laughs) <laughs> See, all of, your tra- deal. all of your trail listeners are going to be like, you dumb fuck. Like, this is an American major. No, you're no, learning. Right? You're learning. Everybody is eager to have you and to welcome you and no. to feed you Kool-Aid. But like legitimately, I, so I was like, oh, like, I guess I could qualify off of that. They're like, you probably can't qualify for this year, but maybe for next year. I'm like, okay, cool. That sounds fun. Can I get on the wait list? And they're like, sure, you're not going to get off because a lot of people are on the wait list. I'm like, okay, just put me on. And then no doubt somebody probably saw the name Molly Seidel on there was like, let her off the wait list. And so I accidentally signed up for Canyons. And the day, like legitimately, probably like a day or two after I signed up, that Canadian running article came out because originally I had been hoping, I'm like, maybe people won't notice. I can just go and do this for fun. Like I haven't really been training that much. So I'm like... I don't know how this is going to go. Obviously, it's really competitive. And now everyone's like, Olympic marathon or switching to trails. I'm like, no, that was not the intention of any of this. I just wanted to maybe try to get into OCC. And now I'm like, it, well, expi- but- it spiraled so quickly. It's so quickly. <laughs> well, OK. I mean, so obviously, a lot of people, I'm sure, want to hear about that. Like, OCC, their top 10 at Canyons does have ramifications, yeah. right? That being qualification for OCC, which is effectively the world championship of the 50K. Yeah. See, because that's that the something thing. that I like, I would do it if I could get in. I mean, I like, I just want to go to Chamonix. I really like Chamonix. I want to go and spend the summer in Europe. Like, it, it's the kind of thing where it's like, I want to be like, my goal is to try and be able to maybe do like a, a spring summer trail season before I get into fall marathon training. That yeah. would be like my ideal. Obviously it kind of depends how Canyons goes. We're playing it all by ear here. I'm just, yeah. I'm not putting any pressure on this. Like if I go out and absolutely suck at Canyons, I'll be like, okay, peace. It's been fun. It's been real. If it goes well, sure. I'll keep doing it as long as it like works out. But it's like, legitimately there is like no master plan on any of this. I'm just trying to have a good time. I really love it. And I really feel that uh, having never met you before that you're made for it. And especially in the way that you described your first marathon at the trials where it was a very hard course and you came out of nowhere and qualified for team USA. Mm -hmm. And then at the Olympics, when it's 95 degrees on the, Mm -hmm. it, it, Toughness is where you shine. Trails are tough in a different way. And yeah. it t- feels to me like maybe you are uniquely suited to perform well in our sport. And I'm sure there's <laughs> thousands of people who are excited to see it. But, Share a little bit about your training to the extent you feel comfortable, mm-hmm. because obviously you're no stranger to working hard and mm-hmm. behaving like a professional, but this is new territory for you. Yeah. You do need to learn new skills. What does that look like? It's been interesting. So it's actually been a really fun like challenge of just doing different things. Like I, I know marathon training inside and out at this point. And it's been honestly like this fun adventure to just be doing different stuff. I mean, like this morning there's, um, like a peak outside of town. It's like 2000 feet or something called O'Leary. That's just like, Oh, might as well just try and run up and down that. And it's like, it's, it's fun getting to experiment in different like just different avenues. Like I don't really know what trail training looks like quite yet. Um, Hopefully if it goes okay. And once I can start running a little bit more pain-free on pavement, on flat ground, I can get back into like integrating more normal marathon workouts into it. I think the aspect of trail running that really intrigues me is that like in road running and track, the gains are made in like marginal increments in VO2 or lactate that it's like, you're working as hard as you can to get like a three second PR or like increase your VO2 max by a tiny little bit. Whereas like in trail, there's this whole aspect of like working on your skills, like foot placement, just like it's, it's a lot more other skills that make it like the, 
improvement aspect isn't just hammer yourself into the ground. It's like, how do you finesse it a little bit more? And I think that's really fun to me. But also I realize I'm a total, I like I'm entering this with no ego and not coming in as like, I'm the Olympic medalist, like move aside girls. It's like, I'm coming in as like the karate white belt here. And assuming I'm going to get my ass kicked by girls who really know what they're doing, but with the intention that like, I really want to learn. And I know that like, if I commit myself to it, like I'll learn pretty quickly. Yeah. It's so funny. I'm good buddies with Andrew Bumbelo, mm, you know, the Bumby. former powerman. <laughs> Bumby, my dude. I paced him in his first 100K at Black Canyon nice. in February where he imploded and experienced <laughs> the depths of ultra marathon suffering. And yeah. like you with Speedgoat, he jumped into the deepest of deep ends mm-hmm. against the most competitive field in one of the most competitive fields in North America. Yeah, Black Canyon racing is no fucking history. joke. <laughs> Yeah. So, but I think he approached it in the same way. Obviously it didn't turn out perfectly for him and I'm sure he learned a lot. It was a concentrated day of learning and suffering, but Mm -hmm. he approached it like a white belt without ego, not coming in like, Hey, I ran 210 in the marathon. I'm going to beat the shit out of all these slow trail guys. He came Mm -hmm. in humble and he was humbled even more. And, but I know he's been indoctrinated himself. Yeah. Anyway, I look forward to seeing you both. And I think that's the fun thing too. Like I've had the experience of getting absolutely blown by girls on the downhill at speed goat and on the uphill as well. So it's like, I know that life I'm like, I'm not afraid to like walk if I have to, like at a certain point, it's the kind of thing where it's like, yeah, it's fun getting to go in as the novice and like not really know what to expect. I think everyone at this point expects me to like know what I'm doing on the roads. And I'm like, yeah, I get to be the fucking rookie at this. Yeah. Okay. So we can start winding down here, but one thing I really did want to ask you about was about Puma specifically, Mm -hmm. because trail has exploded as a category and all the big brands are investing in a major way, you Mm -hmm. know, Nike and Adidas and Hoka, New Balance. You just saw, I'm sure you saw the Lululemon thing that just happened a few weeks ago. Puma is noticeably absent with the exception of you running Mm -hmm. canyons. Do you have any idea of whether or not they may be taking the trail category seriously in the near future? All I can say, Puma wasn't in distance, like Puma wasn't in road running until three years ago. And now they're the hottest thing in road running. So it's like, it's that kind of thing where I think with the right athlete, with the right energy and like the right investment, things move quickly. And it's like, there's a lot of people at Puma who are really into trail running And I think it just takes, I don't know, if I can go out and try and run fast in their shoes and do some cool stuff in Puma trail shoes, like they do have trail shoes, as shocking as that might be to you. Um, But it's like, I don't know, why the hell not? Like, (laughs) we'll see if we can get a Puma house going at Chamonix this summer. If I can go out and race well enough at Canyons and convince them that they should get a house in Chamonix, let's do it. (laughs) Let's do it. Yeah, that's actually funny because maybe that, Puma relationship because you were kind of their first marquee distance running. I was yeah. athlete when so, so this is, when I joined them, they did not have a distance shoe on the market yet. It was actually mm. kind of like it was. It's been cool to see just how much it's grown because when I signed with them, they weren't in the distance space. They hadn't released a shoe yet. I was the first athlete they put in their shoes, and it was really taking a chance going from Saucony, who I'd qualified in their shoes, to switching brands. And just the energy that I saw there, the people who work there, I was like, this is a brand that I know that like, they're willing to move fast and break things. And I told them straight up, I'm like, guys, like I intend to win a medal in like in the shoes that I'm wearing. Like, can you give me a pair of shoes that I can do that? And they're like, absolutely. And I had a medal by that summer. So it's like, is that kind of thing that it's like, things move quickly. And I have really appreciated that they support me fully as the athlete that I am. They don't make me be anything that I'm not. And it's like, Mm. I'm going to like, I support the people who support me. (laughs) This is maybe perfect way to close it because it feels to me as if we're bringing it full circle in that signing with Puma was the unorthodox, maybe contrarian decision to make at that moment Mm -hmm. when you qualified for the Olympic team. They didn't have a super shoe. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I'm sure you recognize the need to have quality footwear in today's Mm -hmm. day and age to have a chance of getting a medal and putting your trust in them and Mm -hmm. taking a big risk at the same time paid Mm -hmm. off for both of you. Mm -hmm. And now it'll be exciting to see 
whether or not they maybe have any exposure to trail running in yeah. the future. Molly, it's so fun to chat with you, man. This is so fun. And I'll be at yeah. Canyons. I can't wait to hang out there. I know. We um, like just come and find me at any point. Like I'll be showing yes. up in the truck. Like you'll see me with the, the Tacoma with the Tapui tent on it. <laughs> Cool. I'll be in the F-150 filled with Kool-Aid for you. My traditional closing question for you, Molly, is this is, again, something I ask everybody who comes on the show is who is one person that you admire? It can be inside or outside of sport, living or dead. And why do you admire that person? Um, I I was thinking about this on my run this morning. Um, I really admire my grandma Barbie. Um, and I know that's probably not like what <laughs> you're probably hoping for, like an inspirational runner. But um my my grandma Barbie was like, or she's still alive. She's in her nineties now, but like she is like what I think of as like the true Renaissance woman. She like like was one of the first women to ever sail like in the Midwest. She won the inland when she was young. She had three kids. Then decided at age forty she wanted to become an architect. Became an architect, um, and then after she and my grandfather divorced, um, when she was I believe around like fifty or so, she was like fuck it. I'm moving back to Colorado and I'm becoming an artist. And she has been an artist since then and is like this woman that is constantly innovating, constantly changing up who she is. Like she's 92 and she's still like, she blows my mind sometimes with the stuff that she does. And I'm like, man, I hope I could be like half the woman that she is. <laughs> Hell yeah. Barbie, her spirit lives on mm -hmm. a couple generations mm -hmm. later with you, Molly. So fun to get to know you and, and chat. Really appreciate the time. And again, look forward to seeing you at Canyons. Yeah, I can't wait to see you out there. <laughs>